So we're talking about empowering point this morning, which to be honest, it took me a while to get my head around it because I'm like, man, I just feel like Gary's done such a good job of teaching us that we have a calling and a purpose and, and equipping us, you know, to know that we have spiritual gifts and stuff like that. So I'm like, I feel kind of redundant in bringing this message, but um, praise God, the Holy Spirit's going to do this thing, right? So what does God want to do in my life? That's the question. Um, and you saw that played out in the dramas. And I just thought it was so well done. Uh, this morning with you, Hire and Daryl. So, empowering point, what does God want to do in my life? So we saw the Ascend Camp thing too, which just happened to play into the message as well about being chosen, right? And, and I love the way they took you higher from a group of people on the street and transported them somewhere else, because that's kind of what it's like when God does choose you, you know? He just kind of picks you out because he chooses who he wants, like here, and he says, I'm going to use you to do this. Um, and as I was pondering this message as well, I'm like, what does God want to do in my life? Like, I can't give you a concrete answer for you personally for exactly what it is that God wants to do in your life because it is unique to you. Um, and that's what I loved about Ehiah's character. He was stuck in a desk job, but he loves to do gardening. And, and typically God will do something like that with you. You know, he's, he's put things inside of you that are unique to you. It's about the way you see and someone else may not love that, enjoy that, or even want to do that, but it's like, it's inside of you, and you feel this pull, and that's kind of about the calling, so I'm going to get into a few scriptures right now. Chosen. In John 15, 16, um, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Okay, so Jesus is telling the disciples, he says, uh, you didn't choose to follow me, you responded to a call because I chose you first. So in this house today, if we're in this house today, it's, it's like you didn't choose to be here, God chose you and you responded to a call. Like, I feel like I should go to church today, and if, if it's your first time here, then praise God, I just want you to know, you didn't choose to come, God chose you to be here, and he called you, and you were responding by attending this morning. So praise God, God wants to speak to you specifically this morning. Um, and that's a cool thing. I think, I've thought about this from time to time. Like you'll see concerts um, and, you know, let's just say Beyonce, right? She's up there and she's like, I'm going to choose somebody from the crowd to come up here, um, you know, and then like she'll choose one person out of the crowd and bring them up and that person goes absolutely crazy. They're like, I can't believe Beyonce chose me out of everybody. She chose me to be on the stage, you know, and, and they, they go absolutely crazy. And it's the same. We should have the same um, exhilaration and joy knowing that our God, out of everyone in the world, he chose you. He could have chosen anybody. There were millions of people out there, but God chose you. And I think that in itself is a very empowering statement. Like, my God chose me. I didn't choose him. He wanted me. And I didn't. You know, I'm responding to a call when I follow him, when I show up. Um, that's our first scripture. Second one, Romans 8, he then says, And now having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And so I think we'll just go through this scripture slowly. And having chosen them, so if you look at the 12 disciples that God did choose, there is all some random dudes like, you know, there were, there were holy dudes around when Jesus was there. They all had robes. It's like, you know, if, if we were to choose somebody to follow Jesus, if we were to choose people to impart um, the gospel, the message that Jesus is going to give the people, you, we would probably, you know, because we've got this like little checklist and credentials, right, criteria. Well, I just think, yep, that's a good thing. They do this, they do that, they do this. Jesus is like, nah, I don't see the way you see. Neither do I choose the way you choose. I'm going to look for people who you might not think have it. I'm going to choose this random fisherman. His name's Peter. Right, he's got an attitude. I'm going to choose James and John, sons of thunder. These dudes, man, they erupt. Like, you'll see in the scripture that they said, should we call down fire from heaven, Lord? Like, no grace. <laughs> Let's retaliate. Let's use this power to bring your glory, and they will know. Like, you know, that kind of sons of thunder, they weren't gracious and kind and sweet. But God chose them. And I'm like, and having chosen them, these imperfect vessels, he called them to come to him and he made them have right standing with himself. He did it. 
You know, again, it's like, oh, but that person's a better fit. Not in God's eyes. He doesn't want you coming to him knowing that you've got it in yourself. He wants to make you have right standing with himself. So he gets the glory, right? Like, I did it. I changed them. They didn't have it on their own. I gave it. I'm God. And having given them the right standing, he then gave them his glory. All right, a couple of weeks ago, I preached on dwelling place, and the glory of the Lord was indicative of the presence of God. All right, and the presence of God today is the Holy Spirit. And so he gave them his glory. He gave them his spirit. He empowered them so that anything they do, his spirit will get the glory. Because you've got sons of thunder, crazy dudes who want to rain down fire. If they show grace, that's not them. You know what I mean? They're not going to get the glory. Oh, yeah, James and John are just such nice people. No, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. They were like ruckus. They were crazy. Um, so when they're gracious, people are like, wow, God must be real. Like, praise God. <laughs> um, you know, this is the kind of choosing that God does. So, like, I think sometimes we try to disqualify ourselves before we begin. Um, like, oh, God wouldn't choose me. Why would God use me? Well, over and over and over again, as we read the Bible, we see people with that same mindset, people without any standing of their own getting right standing with him. And he does it. So every single person in this room is a candidate. You're all a candidate. And as I said earlier, if you're in here, you responded to a call because God chose you to be here, right? So Ephesians 2.10, he says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So not only has God chosen you, this random little you, that's like, we should be exhilarated and full of joy, right? Wow, I can't believe God chose me. Yeah, he did. Not only that, he's got something for you to do. And he prepared it in advance. He knew this before calling you, before you coming in. God said, I've already got a plan. I've already got some work for you to do. Because this is my work. We are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork. Isn't that cool? created in him to do good works, prepared in advance for us to do. So, hope you know now you're chosen. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Um, and so over here, if you recognize these things, these are our spiritual gifts. So not only did God choose us, he equips us. God equips us. So God chooses us, he qualifies us, he makes us have right standing with himself. He has something in advance for us to do. And you're like, well, how would I do it? Well, God knew that too. So God has spiritual gifts that he's given to each one of us, right? And in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6, he says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, it is the same God at work. Again, you see this uniqueness to the call, right? Like, what I do, you might not do. What you do, I might not do. Like, I helped out at Ignite Camp a couple of weeks ago. Praise God, it was fun, but it's not my calling. Like, I walked the way going, I'm praying for Rob and Tungy Wai and April um, that God will pour out his anointing on them because he's called them to that. Like, I didn't feel compelled to come back ever, no. <laughs> but God is good because they feel it, and the fruits of them doing what God has called them to do is that there's this unique thing he's doing, and they're able to touch the kids in a way. Because there's an anointing on them for that, right? Because if God's put you to it and called you to it, he gives you the anointing to do it through spiritual gifts. Um, and I think what's cool about this is it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit, yep. So, and then he says there are different kinds of service. Um, and another translation, I think it's NLT, it says there are different kinds of ministries. You know, there are different kinds of ministries, like the youth ministries, like um, teaching ministries, impact group leaders, anything like that. You can think of all sorts of things. Different kinds of ministries, different um, spiritual gifts, but the same God, right? He gets the glory because he's, he's, he's in every single part of it. Um, and the next part I want to talk on is, so he gives us spiritual gifts. And I think as a church, we know this one. Spiritual gifts is like, it's what we know, right? Talents, oh, sorry. Talents and abilities. In Exodus, Exodus 31, 4 to 6, he says, um, and he's talking about this guy named Behelel. And Ohilob, I think it is, random names. Um, yeah, I'll just read it from here. And he says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. 
when I read that, I was like, that's so cool, because I always wondered, you know, like I knew we had spiritual gifts, which are, you know, these things here, and I'm like, what about those other abilities? Like, can we give God the glory and the credit for that? Because to me, it just makes sense that God will put things on the inside of us to enable us, right? And here it says, and I filled him with the Spirit of God. And, it's, and he's talking about things like artistic designs. So, you know, even if you're thinking like, oh, I'm a very artistic person and I love to do these kind of things, like that's also put on the inside of you by God. And he'll and have a way to use it. And in a creative church like this, there are outlets, right, for the creativity and all the, all the cool things that pop into our heads. We have an outlet for that. And God has a purpose for that. See, in this scripture, Exodus 31, what he's saying is this is when he said to Moses, I want you to make the tabernacle. He said, what I'm going to do is I want you to make the tabernacle, but, you know, I don't just call you to do something and not equip you to do it. He's like, I'm going to fill these people with the Spirit of God, and they're going to have the abilities to make this happen. It was even sewing. Um, if you read further down, I didn't put that up here, but he said people that can do the cloth, even. I'm like, that's so cool. So God will bring everything into place to do what he wants to do, and he leaves nothing out. Um, so I'm wondering... Sorry, I should go back because I'm just like, if God enables us, if God chooses us, if God says he can use us um, in all of these things, then I wonder what it is that stops us. If God's given us the spiritual gift, if God's given us the talents and the abilities, if God's called us, if he's given us the spirit of God and, and his glory dwells in us, then, then why don't we do it? Why, why do we kind of, we don't get as excited? Like if Beyonce were to call you up on stage, I don't know who... I don't, you know, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just like, is that a good example? But anyway, if somebody were to call you up on stage, right, and, and you love that person, you get so happy, but sometimes when God calls us, we go, um, as if he's wrong, you know? Are you sure you want me? And we see that with Moses, right? Moses does that, but that's further on the sermon. So I'll just go into a tale of two kings, uh, Saul and David. So I love studying Saul and David. I love them because you see two men um, pulled from obscurity into positions to rule the country, basically. They become the kings over Israel. Two, um, yeah, two men plucked from obscurity, two men called to the kingdom, two men called to reign. And you see two very different outcomes. Now, if you're familiar with Saul and David's stories, you'll know where I'm going with this. But if you're not... Uh, just pay attention, because there's a few things in here that I find interesting. And I love to study them, because I like to think to myself, why did David make it, and why did Saul not? So you get two different outcomes. One where, you know, two, same circumstances and everything, same position, right? Same calling, but two very different outcomes. Sorry, guys. I don't know why that happened. Anyway. Um, okay. So I want to talk about this first part here, which was pleasing God and pleasing man. So when Saul became king, he was plucked from obscurity again. He was just randomly um, trying to get something for his father. And Samuel, the prophet, says, here's from God. And, and God says, this is going to be the next king. The next king's going to um, pop into your house. You're going to tell him where his donkeys are. And I want you to anoint him. So Saul's just going about his business. Like, he's not, like, pursuing to be anything or be anyone. He's just going about his business. And Samuel the prophet anoints him and says, you will be the next king over Israel. And Saul's like, huh? You know, it's, this is new to Saul. So he, he's kind of freaking out. Um, and then he says, when you go down the street later on, you'll meet up with the prophets and you will start to prophesy. And he's like, huh? What do you mean? And then you see in the story that the Spirit of God, as he's walking down the street, the Spirit of God falls on him. He starts prophesying. Um, as Samuel had said, and, and then people say, is Saul now among the prophets? Like, they were puzzled. They're like, I know this guy. Why is he prophesying? I, I know him. And so God's choosing this, this random little dude named Saul. Now, it started off well for Saul. It started off really, really well for Saul. Saul, um, it says that the Spirit of God filled him, and he would go to conquer territories, and he would be taking the victory, and it was awesome. And I'm like, this is a great start to the story. Like, you want it to end well, but it doesn't. Why? He's taking the victory and all this stuff, and the first time God says to him, all right, you're going to take the victory over this place, but I, what I want you to do is wait seven days, and then Samuel's going to come up, and I want you to present an offering to me, okay? 
That's all I want, simple instructions, very simple instructions, then the victory will come, okay? It's very simple, cool. Well, after seven days, Saul's waiting and he doesn't see Samuel, okay? And it says that as Saul's waiting, the men, his men, the people in his army, the people he's supposed to take the victory with, these guys begin to scatter, okay? And so Saul, looking at the men, He's like, what? The men are scattering. I've got to do something. I'll just take this offering and I will present it to God myself. And so he's like, hey guys, don't worry about it. You don't have to run away. Don't be scared. Okay, I will do the offering. Even though God said Samuel will do it, it is the seventh day we're waiting. I mean, come on, let's, let's just do this. And it's, like I said, it's a very simple instruction and it seems like a very innocent solution to a problem, right? So he presents this offering to God and then Samuel comes up and he's like, hey, what happened? How come you didn't wait for me? God's not pleased with you now, Saul. You didn't follow his instructions. And Saul's like, oh, oh, but the, but the men were scattering. They, they were afraid. And so, and so I just thought this would be the right answer, would be to present the offering myself. And Sam was like, no, but you didn't follow the Lord's instructions. And it's at this point that God says to him, I have chosen a man. I am now seeking a man who is after, a man after my own heart, someone who will follow my instructions. And Saul's like, oh man, like he's repentant because, you know, like he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to fall from God's grace, but God's like, I'm, I'm choosing someone else because you can't even follow a simple instruction, Saul. Like I just asked you to do something small. It was a small thing. And so that's, that's when he says, I'm going to choose somebody else. And then that's, I think it's in Samuel 1, Samuel 13. And then we go over to 1 Samuel 15. And again, they're out at war, and God says, all right, I'm going to give you this territory. Go in there, take it, take the victory. You will have it. I am with you. I am the Lord your God. Do not be afraid. And Saul's like, sweet, we're going to take the victory. And then God says, but kill everything. I want all the sheep, I want the cattle, all the jewelry. Don't bring any of it home. Destroy it all. Now Saul, he's a leader, man. He's like, oh, okay, we took the victory, praise God, but the sheep look good. Those sheep look nice and fat. I could take those home and we could, we could do something with them. Never mind the fact that God said destroy everything. He's like, I just want to keep that sheep. It, you know, it's just practical reasons, right? Again, doesn't seem super sinful. And then Samuel, again, <laughs> poor prophet Samuel, um, <laughs> has to come and rebuke the king again. And he's like, oi, you didn't listen again. And Saul's like, um, well, and he's like, why didn't you listen? And he said, well, I was afraid of the people. The people wanted the stuff. They were like, this, isn't this good plunder? Shouldn't we take it home for ourselves? What a waste if we destroy it. And so again, Saul's letting the people navigate what he's doing instead of God. Like he's looking to them like, oh, how are you responding right now? Maybe I should stop this message. You ain't looking. You know what I mean? No, I'm not looking to you for validation. I'm looking to him. But Saul, Saul was looking to them. And as soon as they gave him a little, he's like, he's controlled by it. He was living to please a oh man and not God. Because every time God would say something, he'd go, oh, but the people said, oh, but the people are freaked out. Nah, it's very sad. So, yeah, and this is what he says. He said, I have sinned and violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. You could actually title this slide Fear of God versus Fear of Man. And, and like, I didn't, you know, I had to be careful with that one because when people say fear of God, it's like, well, perfect love casts out all fear. Yeah, but there's a different fear. There's like a holy reverence and an awe we hold God in. Like, it's not like, I'm so scared of you, God. No, it's like, you are so amazing, God. Like, I'm going to do what you call me to do and, like, I'm going to listen to you. Here, you see the fact, so... So God says, actually, straight after that, 1 Samuel 15, straight after that, it says that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Okay? And 1 Samuel 16, Samuel goes and he anoints the next king, a man named David. Now David, little shepherd boy, is now anointed the next king. And again, just like Saul, just randomly going about his day when God's like plucking him out of obscurity and saying, this is what's going to happen for you. You know, so I think when we go, oh, I don't know what to do with my life, well, God will find you. 
You know what I mean? There's those songs, I was lost, but now I'm found. Like, God will find you. He's called you here. He chooses you. He'll find you. You just need to be alert, right? And so he says, and everything, this is about David, and everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. Why? Because he's looking at people all the time, right? And he sees this dude, and this dude has this anointing, and this dude, everything he touches is going well, and this is scaring Saul. Like, oh my gosh, I can't be around this dude. He's just too successful. But it's funny because 1 Samuel 16, David becomes the anointed king over Israel, but he doesn't have the position yet. He only has the anointing. At the end of 1 Samuel 16, it says that because the spirit of the Lord has now departed from Saul, a tormenting spirit had come to be with him. And so now Saul is tormented night and day. He, he just like, he has no peace. Spirit of God's gone and, and you know, the demons have come. That's what it sounds like. And it says that they say, well, why don't we find a harp player for you? Guess who the harp player is? The next anointed king. So David comes and the anointing is even on the harp. The anointing is even on the harp. So he plays the harp and it says the, the tormenting spirits leave Saul and he's at peace. He's like, I like this kid, David. This kid, David's cool. First Samuel 17, what happens? David and Goliath. The famous story that you probably would have heard of, even if you have never been to church. David and Goliath, right? He takes the victory over this giant. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is on him, and wherever he goes, and whatever he touches, God blesses. And then it's in 1 Samuel 18, um, where it says that Saul was so pleased with David because he saw he had success in everything he was doing, and he's like, cool, you could serve me. You could be a part of, uh, you could actually be the commander of my army. I'm going to make you the commander of my army, David. So David becomes the commander of Saul's army, and... Um, it's good. He's happy. He's happy because everything that he does has favor because Saul's the king and, and he hasn't taken that yet. He can serve under me. He can be successful. And it's kind of like Saul gets the credit, you know, except for one day, first Samuel 18 again, the woman starts singing the song and they're singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David is tens of thousands. And it says Saul's reaction to that. And Saul's like, huh? And he gets very angry. He said, what can he take next but the kingdom? Like, oh, yeah, you don't know. He's about to. <laughs> He's about to take the kingdom. And so, so Saul now is afraid of David from, from being very pleased with him because when David's around, things are going well because he plays the harp and the spirit goes. When he takes my armies out, we win. Even the people are pleased with him, but now he's getting the glory too. Now people are talking about David more than they're talking about me. And he set out, from that point, it says that he never took his eyes off David. He made sure he could see everything he was doing because jealousy was setting in. And here's David's response. David is a man of God, and, and remember what God said? He said, I'm choosing now a man after my own heart. Okay, and from 1 Samuel 18 on to here where we get to 1 Samuel 26, Saul is pursuing David to kill him. What did David do? Nothing but follow God. What was David doing? Being anointed, <laughs> walking with the Spirit of God. He didn't do anything horrible. He didn't even do anything wrong to Saul. All he did was be who he was called to be, right? You will find opposition when you are being who God called you to be. It's just a part of it, right? So who would this person be? Who would Saul be to David if we're describing him in the context of a battle? He'd be the enemy, right? So I want to talk about the fact that sometimes we... We do find the call of God on our lives, and we feel like, man, I'm stepping into something, and God is so good. When I do it, his anointing is on me, and I, and I feel his spirit, and I feel his presence, and things work out well, and I praise God. I praise God, you know? And we wonder why opposition is coming. <laughs> That's what happened to David. Opposition was coming in the form of Saul. Saul was being the enemy to David, and we have an enemy of our souls, right? And we want to know why... When I start moving in the things God's doing, why does everything start to go crazy around me? It's a perfectly executed plan coming from an enemy who, who sees the anointing, who sees the call, who sees that you're chosen, even if you don't. And he's like, I'm going to pursue you. I will kill you. The Bible says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. What was Saul setting out to do? To kill David. All right, so anything in you that is anointed, anything in you that is chosen or called, 
there is an opposition, but the scripture says, if God is for me, who can be against me? Right? If God is for me, if Saul only looked up, it could have been a different story for him. He could have been, you know, in, in, the, in the generational heritage, I don't know, sorry, Vivian, I don't have the proper word for it, um, but in the lineage, I think it is, of Christ, it says that Jesus is the son of David, and if we read back to what First Samuel 13, when God first gets an orb with Saul, he says, you would have been a king that would have gone through all generations. It would have been Jesus, the son of Saul. But Saul's too busy looking at people. So it becomes Jesus, the son of David. And, and that's what we see all over and over in Scripture. And it's a sad thing. Like I, The one thing I'd hate to do is lose my place in this world, the thing that God's called me to do because I was too scared. Because I was looking at others, right? That, that's the worst thing I could think of. So, sorry I've gone on a tangent. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And so what's happening here is Saul set out to pursue him. David's been on the run, man. David's been hiding in caves. David is like writing his psalms in the middle of the, this horribleness. And David's, you know, he's hiding and, and he gets to a point where he sees Saul. And he has an opportunity to kill Saul, right? But he pleases God. David lives to please God, so he says, even Abishai, the commander of his army, says, we've got him, he's here, he's cornered, shall we do something, what shall we do? What shall we do, David? David says, don't do it. Who can lay a hand on God's anointed and be guiltless? And you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place of heart, right? This is why God chose him, because he was after God. He wasn't after that, he knew he was the next anointed king. He could have said, you need to move, Saul, I'm about to kill him, I'll take my place in the kingdom, I'm anointed after all. But he didn't. <laughs> he's like, no. Until so God does it, I won't move. I'm not going to be the one to destroy these people. I'm not going to take part in the enemy's games. I want to be a part of what God's doing. I don't set out to kill, steal, and destroy. I don't care if you're better at doing that than me. I don't care if I feel like I'm supposed to be where you are. I will not participate in any of that malice, any of that stuff. This is David's heart, right? Because he wants to seek to be like God. He doesn't want to seek to be like the devil, killing, stealing, and destroying people. If you have an opportunity to destroy someone's reputation and, you know, it's like Abishai's like, hey, come, look, this is what so-and-so did. Did you hear about it? Like, do you just cut off a piece of the robe and say, I could have, I could have been that person? Or do you take your knife and stab them? Are you participating in God's army or the devil's army? Killing, stealing and destroying or bringing life? Choosing, taking that opportunity to cover someone instead of expose them. Don't destroy him, he says. So this is David's position. He sought to please God, even though Saul was after him. The other part I see, and, and if, you're, um, you know, if you're up with preachers on the internet these days, you would have seen Christine Kane's got an anointing versus gifting sermon out right now. It rocks. It's amazing. Um, Michael's, Michael Todd, I think his name is. He's got a, a Mark series out, and it's all based on anointing. Um, you know, and it's just like... Everywhere it's happening. Sorry, guys. Never mind. <laughs> God is good. He will refresh me. Um, <laughs> position. But now, yeah, so he says, Now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's, Lord's command. Okay? Um, yeah, so we see here, and this is what struck me about the story. It's just like, you know, David's anointed to take the kingdom. But he doesn't have the position yet. But it doesn't matter because he's got the anointing. So no matter what David does, God's putting his favor on him, right? Saul still has the position. But it doesn't matter what Saul does, the anointing's left. The spirit of the Lord has departed from him. And I'm like, man, in our lives, as we pursue the call of God and we feel chosen to do things, are we seeking a position and a title? Are we like, I need to sit there, I need to have that title before I know who I am? Or is it like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've got a title or position. You know who you are. The anointing goes with you. You know, it's like, we, we need to seek God in our lives and our calling instead of seeking position or title. Because position or title doesn't mean anything. 
because Saul had the position and he kept it for 20 years. David had the anointing and he didn't get the position for 20 years. You know, anointing and position are two very different things. And that, that again, like, you know, the fear of God, like I was saying, that, that instills the fear of God in me. Like, I'm like, I never want a position without the anointing. You know what I mean? I never want a position without the anointing. I would rather have the anointing without a position. Like, just let me live in obscurity, but have your spirit with me. That's all I want. But you give me the position, you take the anointing away, like, you may as well kill me, Lord. Like, I don't want to do it on my own, right? Um... And in Luke 16, 10, he says, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Like, if we're wondering what we need to do and what God's called us to do, man, start with what you have. What do you have right now? What are you doing right now? You know, when I first became a Christian, I think I was 18, and I, and I wanted a ministry, and I'm like, what do I have in my hand? Well, I was like, at that time, so I became a Christian at 18, but by the time I started ministry, I was 19, and I, and I had a one-year-old child, and I'm like... I'm 19, I have a one-year-old child, what could I do, Lord? And I'm like, well, well what do you want to do, Jess? Well, I'm like, I want to reach people for you. So I started a play group here. I'm like, because people in this community are young parents, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, you're from Puerto Rico, you got a kid? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you <laughs> ever heard that kind of ghetto saying, but I, I, I did. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, okay, cool. So I could reach these people. I'm like, that's what I've got in my hand. I am one of them, but I have Jesus with me. So I started a play group, right? And people are like, oh, you should do early childhood training. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't feel called to sit with children. I don't feel called to teach children. I don't even like enjoy it. I'm doing this because what I've got in my hand. And I'm like, all right, God, use me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I felt this like pull to working with kids. That wasn't it. And then I did mainly music and I was faithful with that for a few years. And it's like, you know, that's what God's looking at. He's looking at how you deal with the small responsibilities he puts in your hand. Like, I feel called to big things. Well, look after what you have right now. Drink. Oh, thank you, Karen. Praise God. Um, yeah, so look after what you have right now. The small things. You know, don't despise them. Jesus doesn't. He's watching you in that moment. He's like, how are you handling this? Are you being faithful? And, and you're an impact group leader. How are you handling it when people come and confide in you? Do you go and use that to gossip about them and destroy them? They don't. They don't. That's just an example. I just want to vouch for our impact group leaders right now. Um, <laughs> an example I pulled out of nowhere. Um, but, you know, like God's looking at that and he's like, how are you being faithful with the little you have right now? Because that's going to determine what I do in the future. I'm watching you. Watching you, Saul, can you handle a couple of little instructions? He couldn't. All right. OCD. <laughs> this is something that can put us off our calling too. Obsessive comparison disorder. Okay? Saul and David, right? Saul's like, what's he doing? The anointing's following him over there? Like, he, he's just constantly comparing himself to David. He's, he's always looking at what the people think. So OCD is, is terrible for the believer. It is not empowering. <laughs> it is disempowering. We've got to stop the obsessive comparison disorder and just be uniquely us. You know, I can't do what you do, and that's okay. You can't do what I do, and that's okay. You might do what I do better. That's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's okay. Because I don't do it for you, I do it for him. And he goes, thank you, Jess, you brought it. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, your spirit was with me. Saul has called us thousands and David has tens of thousands. So, sorry, I always do this. When I bring a sermon, I put slides up and I go ahead. So I want to ask us a question, because sometimes we're like, am I in the will of God? Because it doesn't seem like it. Do you know what's happening in my life right now? If I'm anointed and spirit-filled and empowered and called and chosen, then why is my life a mess? Why is there so much rubbish surrounding me? Here's Joseph. Joseph gets a dream from God, and he's so excited about it. He's like, I need to tell someone, hey, I should tell my brothers because my brothers love me. And so he runs up and tells his brothers, hey, I got this dream from God. He said this and that and that. And straight away they're like, what? Are you saying? They take it personally. They don't like it. Even though it's from the sovereign God, they don't, they're not excited about this dream the way Joseph's excited about this dream. What happens immediately following a divine revelation from heaven for Joseph, his brothers 
throw him in a well, sell him to a trader. Then the next step is he becomes a slave and a servant in a guy named Potiphar's house. And again, you know what? And I find this intriguing. When you read the story of Joseph, it says the favor of God was on him. And I'm like, man, if we pulled that apart, we wouldn't say that was favor. Like the favor of God's on him as he's being thrown into a well by his brothers and rejected by them. The favor of God's on him as he becomes a servant in Potiphar's house. The favor of God's on him as he's framed by Potiphar's wife because she wants to sleep with him and he rejects her. So he's framed and it says the favor of God's in him in jail. And I'm like, if any of us were to try to figure out or teach on favor of God, we wouldn't say the favor of God is when you're getting completely annihilated by everyone who loves you, when you're getting thrown into the pit, which is the well, let's just say. You're in jail, but the favor of God's on you. I'm like, that doesn't look like favor to me. That's not what I would expect favor to be. And maybe that's what you're thinking. Like, well, I feel anointed. I've got the spirit of God, but do you know what my life looks like right now? Like, it doesn't look like what I thought it would look like. But that's okay. Because it didn't look like that for Joseph either. So I've been faithful with the small God. Why am I in jail? All I said was a dream. Why do my brothers hate me? It's because when you're following and pursuing after God, he's with you wherever you are and he gives you the strength to do it. It doesn't mean that life gets perfect straight away. But he makes all things work together for the good of those who love him, right? So Joseph, while in jail, is a dream interpreter and he interprets a couple of dreams for these guys. And he says, remember me. And it's two years after this dream interpretation that they do finally remember him. So it's another two years. Another two years in jail where Joseph's just like twiddling his thumbs like, God the stream, I don't see any of it happening. God's like, be patient, Joseph, you're going to get there, and I'm going to use all of this rubbish, all of this mess, everything that everyone threw at you, I'm going to use this, and this will propel you into your destiny. And then I'm going to ask you to go back and save those guys that threw you there. All of this is done so not only you would be safe, but those people that put you there would have refuge. In a time of famine, Joseph has the answer, and his brothers then come to him. All the repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance, right? It's like the kindness of Joseph. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, I remember what I did to you. And he forgives them. It's a process. Then you've got David, same thing. David, like, poor little dude, the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and we've talked about that enough. I don't want to talk too much, but Following God ends up with an enemy pursuing him and him hiding and running for all these years because he's being about to be killed. Moses is the same. So if you want to ask yourself, am I in the will of God because my life doesn't look like what I thought it would look like if I was walking in the anointing and the spirit of God and, and the calling on my life, I thought maybe I'd be in a palace like David. But you see, there was John the Baptist. He was called uniquely and he was in the wilderness and he was eating insects and locusts. But that was the call of God on his life. And then you've got David, who's up in a palace eating banquets. You know what I mean? This is why we don't do the OCD thing. The call of God on my life and the call of God on your life might be different. I might be in the wilderness. You might be in the palace. Praise God. He's going to use you where you are. I don't need to compare. I just need to run my race and fix my eyes and say, God, you want to call me there? I'm coming. I'll respond to you. And, yeah, I, I, I think I've got... I'll go through this quickly because I don't have much time left. So Moses, here's, here's what we usually start. Like God says, hey, come and do this. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. And that's Moses' position. God says to him, hey, I want to send you back into Egypt. And he's like, I can't. Some of the excuses are, um, I'm scared. Do you know what he said? He said, how will they even believe that it was you that sent me? Like, I'm just a little dude. Like, how can I say, well, this is what God says. And God says, and what do you have in your hand? And he says, I have a staff. And he says, drop it to the ground. And he, he makes the staff a snake. He says, pick it up. And God uses what Moses had in his hand at the time to show himself, right? Just think, what do I have in my hand right now? Don't say I can't. And if you do say it to God and God will just say, no, I am the Lord your God, which is what he did to Moses. But, um, and then Moses gets to a point where he says, fine, I can. I can do what you've asked me to do, God. The Lord replied to Moses. This is Exodus 33. I talked about this again in the dwelling place. I've been hanging out with Moses a bit in my Bible. Um, yeah, so, so when 
Moses is about to leave, he says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. You know, and I think if, if, if you want to find out what the call of God on your life is, I suggest you maybe have this in your prayer somewhere, God. If, if you're not leading me, don't take me. If it's not you, close the door. I only want open doors, and I only want open doors from you, God. If your presence does not go up with us from here, do not send me. Like, I won't go without you, Lord. And th- this is the point where Moses gets to, right? He's like, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just come with me. And in Philippians 4.13, our famous scripture, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So when God says, this is what I'd like you to do, instead of saying, I can't say I can, I can. <laughs> then say, I will. Because there's a difference between I can and I will. Like, I can, I don't know, open the door for my children. Doesn't mean I will. I can make a sandwich for my husband when he's hungry, but it doesn't mean I will, right? So having the ability to do something and actually doing something is a very different thing again, okay? So we now move our, our thinking from I can't to I can to I can to I will. I will do it, God. I will do it. And and the example here is David, because before he's about to fight Goliath, he says, and I will this day tell, I'll show people that the Lord God of Israel is real. And I will, and I will, and I will. And guess what? He did. He did. And we want to go from I can't, to I can, to I will, to I did. I did. Because we don't live this life for the audience of everybody else. And that was what Saul didn't get. Saul was looking to the wrong people for validation. I need to look up here. I need to get my validation from here because if he's called me, chosen me, appointed me, anointed me, and all those things, I've already got it. I just need to step into it. Right? I don't need to look to you to say, hey, can you give me the, the, you know, the courage to do this thing? Encouraging and empowering one another is what we're called to do, and that rocks because my group has prayed for me this week. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Impact Group. Um... But yeah, we want to get to the point where we say, I did it. I did it. You know, Jesus, after he finishes on the cross, he said, it's finished. I've done what you called me to do, God. I did it. I did it. And aren't we so grateful that he did? You know? And at the end of our lives, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, when, when God says, hey, I gave you these gifts. I gave you these abilities. I put you in this position. What did you do with it? I did it, Lord. That's what we want to say. I did it, Lord. And we want to hear, well done. You're a good and faithful servant. Come and sit with me for all eternity. Okay? Okay, so here's what we've got. This is where I'm going to finish. Moving our thinking from I can't to I can to I will to I did. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen.